Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll Chapter 1 Down the Rabbit Hole Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice, she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that, nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. But when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it, and burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it and was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way and then dipped suddenly down, so suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her. First, she tried to make out what she was coming to, but it was too dark to see anything. Then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed. It was labeled Orange Marmalade, but to her great disappointment, it was empty. She did not like to drop the jar, so managed to put it into one of the cupboards as she fell past it. Down, down, down. Would the fall never come to an end? There was nothing else to do. So Alice soon began talking to herself. Dinah will miss me very much tonight, I should think. Dinah was the cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. Alice felt that she was dozing off when suddenly, thump, thump, Down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves, and the fall was over. Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped up in a moment. She looked up, but it was all dark overhead. Before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind and was just in time to hear it say, as it turned the corner, Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting. She was close behind it when she turned the corner, but the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall, which was lit up by a row of lamps hanging from the roof. There were doors all round the hall, but they were all locked, 
And when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Suddenly, she came upon a little table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it but a tiny golden key, and Alice's first idea was that this might belong to one of the doors of the hall. But alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate it would not open any of them. However, on the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she had not noticed before, and behind it was a little door about fifteen inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock, and to her great delight, it fitted. Alice opened the door and found that it led into a small passage, not much larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander about among those beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains. But she could not even get her head through the doorway. Oh, said Alice, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I could if I only knew how to begin. Alice went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate, a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time, she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not here before, said Alice. And tied around the neck of the bottle was a paper label with the words, Drink Me, beautifully printed on it in large letters. No, I'll look first, she said, and see whether it's marked poison or not. For she had never forgotten that if you drink from a bottle marked poison, it is almost certain to disagree with you sooner or later. However, this bottle was not marked poison, so Alice ventured to taste it, and finding it very nice, it had a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot buttered toast. She very soon finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so it was indeed. She was now only ten inches high, and her face brightened up at the thought that she was now the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. After a while, finding that nothing more happened, she decided on going into the garden at once. But alas for poor Alice! When she got to the door, she found she had forgotten the little golden key, and when she went back to the table for it, she found she could not possibly reach it. She could see it quite plainly through the glass, and she tried her best to climb up one of the legs of the table, but it was too slippery, and when she had tired herself out with trying, the poor little thing sat down and cried. Come, there's no use in crying like that, said Alice to herself rather sharply. I advise you to leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it. And sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears into her eyes. Soon her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in it a very small cake on which the words eat me were beautifully marked in curtains. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice, and if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key, and if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'll get into the garden, and I don't care which happens. 
She ate a little bit and said anxiously to herself, Which way? Which way? Holding her hand on the top of her head to feel which way she was growing. And she was quite surprised to find that she remained the same size. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. Chapter 2 The Pool of Tears Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that for the moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. Oh, my poor little feet. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. Just at this moment, her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now rather more than nine feet high, and she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Poor Alice! It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side, to look through into the garden with one eye. But to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. She went on shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool all round her and reaching half down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was the white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed, with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself, Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? When the rabbit came near her, Alice began in a low, timid voice, If you please, sir, the rabbit started violently, dropping the white kid gloves and the fan and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could go. Alice took up the fan and gloves and she kept fanning herself all the time she went on talking. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went on just as usual. Was I the same when I got up this morning? But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, that's the great puzzle. As she said this, she looked down at her hands and was surprised to see that she had put on one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves while she was talking. How can I have done that? She thought, I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it and found that she was now about two feet high and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that the cause of this was the fan she was holding and she dropped it hastily just in time to save herself from shrinking away altogether. That was a narrow escape said Alice, a good deal frightened at the sudden change, but very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden, and she ran with all speed back to the little door. But alas, the little door was shut again, and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. Things are worse than ever, thought the poor child. For I never was so small as this before, never. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment, splash, she was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea. However, she soon made out that she was in the pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. Just then she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off, 
and she swam nearer to see what it was. She soon made out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be of any use now? Thought Alice to speak to this mouse. Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. So she began. Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I am very tired of swimming about here, oh mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively and seemed to her to wink with one of its little eyes, but it said nothing. Perhaps it doesn't understand English, thought Alice. I dare say it's a French mouse come over with William the Conqueror. So she began again. Où est ma chatte? Which was the first sentence in her French lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon! Cried Alice hastily, afraid that she had hurt the poor animal's feelings. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Not like cats! Cried the mouse in a shrill, passionate voice. Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not. Said Alice in a soothing tone. Don't be angry about it. And yet I wish I could show you our cat Dinah. I think you'd take a fancy to cat if you could only see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing. The mouse was bristling all over, and she felt certain it must be really offended. We won't talk about her any more if you'd rather not. We indeed cried the mouse. Who was trembling down to the end of its tail, as if I would talk on such a subject? Our family always hated cats, nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't, indeed," said Alice, in a great hurry to change the subject of conversation. "Are you, are you fond of of dogs?" There is such a nice little dog near our house. I should like to show you. It kills all the rats. And oh dear! cried Alice in a sorrowful tone. I'm afraid I've offended it again. For the mouse was swimming away from her as hard as it could go, and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. So she called softly after it, "Mouse dear, do come back again, and we won't talk about cats or dogs either if you don't like them." When the mouse heard this, it turned round and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale, and it said in a low, trembling voice, "Let us get to the shore, and then I'll tell you my history, and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs." It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with the birds and animals that had fallen into it. There were a duck and a dodo, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to the shore. Chapter Three: A Caucasus Race and a Long Tail. They were indeed a queer-looking party that assembled on the bank. The birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, and all dripping wet, cross and uncomfortable. The first question, of course, was how to get dry again. They had a consultation about this, and after a few minutes, it seemed quite natural to Alice to find herself talking familiarly with them, as if she had known them all her life. At last, the mouse, who seemed to be a person of some authority among them, called out. Sit down, all of you, and listen to me. I'll soon make you dry enough. They all sat down at once in a large ring with the mouse in the middle. Ahem," said the mouse with an important air. 
Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. Silence all round, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favored by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English, who wanted leaders, and had been of late much accustomed to usurpation and conquest. Edwin and Morker, the earls of Mercia and Northumbria, oh, said the lordy with a shiver, and even Stigand, the patriotic archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable, found what, said the duck, found it, the mouse replied rather crossly, of course you know what it means. I know what it means well enough when I find a thing, said the duck. It's generally a frog or a worm. The question is, what did the archbishop find? The mouse did not notice this question, but hurriedly went on. Found it advisable to go with Edgar Atheling to meet William and offer him the crown. How are you getting on now, my dear? It continued, turning to Alice as it spoke. As wet as ever, said Alice in a melancholy tone. It doesn't seem to dry me at all. In that case, said the dodo solemnly, rising to its feet, I move that the meeting adjourn for the immediate adoption of more energetic remedies. Speak English, said the eaglet. I don't know the meaning of half those long words, and, what's more, I don't believe you do either. What I was going to say, said the dodo in an offended tone, is that the best thing to get us dry would be a caucus rice. What is a caucus rice? said Alice. Why, said the dodo, the best way to explain it is to do it. First, it marked out a race course in a sort of circle, and then all the party were placed along the course, here and there. There was no one, two, three, and away, but they began running when they liked and left off when they liked, so that it was not easy to know when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so and were quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, The race is over! And they all crowded around it, panting and asking, But who has won? This question the dodo could not answer without a great deal of thought. At last it said, Everybody has won, and all must have prizes. But who is to give the prizes? Quite a chorus of voices asked. Why, she, of course, said the dodo, pointing to Alice with one finger. And the whole party at once crowded round her, calling out in a confused way, Prizes! Prizes! Alice had no idea what to do, and in despair she put her hand into her pocket and pulled out a box of comfits. Luckily, the salt water had not got into it and handed them round as prizes. There was exactly one apiece all round. The next thing was to eat the comfits. This caused some noise and confusion, as the large birds complained that they could not taste theirs, and the small ones choked and had to be patted on the back. However, it was over at last, and they sat down again in a ring, and begged the mouse to tell them something more. "'You promised to tell me your history, you know,' said Alice, "'and why it is you hate C and D.' She added in a whisper, half afraid that it would be offended again. Mine is a long and a sad tale, said the mouse, turning to Alice and sighing. It is a long tale, certainly, said Alice, looking down with wonder at the mouse's tail. But why do you call it sad? And she kept on puzzling about it while the mouse was speaking so that her idea of the tale was something like this. Fury said to a mouse that he met in the house, 
Let us both go to law. I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take no denial. We must have the child. For really this morning I've nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur. Such a child, dear sir, with no jury or judge, would be wasting our breath. I'll be judge, I'll be jury, said cunning old fury. I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. You're not attending, said the mouse to Alice severely. What are you thinking of? I beg your pardon, said Alice very humbly. You had got to the fifth bend, I think. You insult me by talking such nonsense, said the mouse, getting up and walking away. Please come back and finish your story, Alice called after it. And the others all joined in chorus. Yes, please do. But the mouse only shook its head impatiently and walked a little quicker. I wish I had Dinah, our cat, here, said Alice. This caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once, and a canary called out in a trembling voice to its children, Come away, my dears, it's high time you were all in bed. On Verdias pretext, they all moved off and Alice was soon left alone. I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah. Nobody seems to like her down here, and I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. Poor Alice began to cry again, for she felt very lonely and low-spirited. In a little while, however, she again heard a little pattering of footsteps in the distance, and she looked up eagerly.